If we could tell the story of Tucson, what would we say? Who's telling our stories? Can we really see a path forward into our future if we don't have the context of where we've already been? City Psalms was an idea born out of a desire to um, see the kingdom of God come in our city. I think a big part of the process has been looking back at what our city has faced over the course of its history, what kinds of issues it's overcome and how they've been overcome. And the surprising good news that the church actually has been good news to the city over the course of its history and loved and cared for. Uh, as we look at moving forward, we get inspiration by looking at those stories of just how we have been able to follow the lead of Jesus in the past, and that gives us inspiration to do it for the future. I think the music piece is a key of looking forward. It's a, it's a vision casting element to uh, write songs about who we hope to be. The end result, the good news, I think, should be that, that Tucson would be a good place for people. That's how you would know that the Spirit of God was here and that it was changing people and transforming people, is that it would become a good place for people. We really wanted to see the same kind of unity on a broad level in Tucson that we saw developing at our annual pastor prayer summits, where pastors from all across our community met together for three days with the sole purpose of praying together for our city. At those prayer summits, we would pray, but we would also share stories. And the question came up often, who is telling our stories? We need to share our stories. So we realize that prayers for our future have to be connected in some way to how God has moved in the past, because when we're praying for the future, we're relying on God's character and His nature. And we learn those things from His Word, but we see them in action with how he responds and how he leads in the past. And that's the faith building movement that helps propel us to pray forward. We just want to love you as we're all just branches on fire. So tonight is our first attempt at an art exhibit. So this thing that you're walking into is um, we are stumbling along the way of trying to figure this out, but it is beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. The artists are incredible. We uh, recruited a, a bunch of artists who their assignment was to take, if you haven't gotten this information, there are eight stories from our spiritual history, going as far back as Father Kino, and then uh, into the 1870s when the Protestant Reformation finally made its way into the Tucson area and those first churches came. And then from there until about 1920, 1930. So, and these artists, they were tasked to look through these stories and then pick the one that they were most inspired by and then create an expression of prayer for Tucson's future inspired by that story from the past. 
So when you're walking through this exhibit, you're walking through prayers expressed for Tucson's future, inspired by these great stories of how God has moved in the past. Is that cool? Yeah. It was a, a very pleasant experience to see how many other people had picked up on the influences of men that we hardly ever hear of. And I, I suppose Kino might be one of the more visible ones, seeing he has a statue here in the city. Kino was a, a peacemaker and a humanitarian. Uh, he, he brought fruit trees and grains into these valleys, the Santa Cruz Valley, the Altar Valley, uh, many of the other valleys in Sonora. And uh, he brought cattle and horses and sheep and goats, burros, introduced those to the people and turned them into husbandmen. Anything to increase the ability of the people to take care of themselves and feed themselves. He brought many blessings to this country. And long after he died, the, the uh, influence of Kino lived on. Jesus Christ was presented to the native people in a loving fashion. So I got to reading and I found that Kino was responsible for starting congregations in areas that later led to the building of churches. And um, I found some 22 of these locations that were, their roots were in, in Kino's ministry. Kino was nothing of a salesman. He was a sincere man who loved God, loved people, and as a consequence, his memory just has, well, it's just, it's not died. I don't think his influence has been appreciated. He managed to live the lifestyle he believed. And I think that's one of the things that the, the, the Native people saw about him. They could trust him. And I think that, that it, it, it's worth, if people want to enjoy Tucson and the cultures here, I think, I think the place to start is to get better acquainted with our history. So here's this kid who's living in Italy, and he's on the fast track. He's of influence and affluence. He's in the best school, and he's, he's brilliant. And they're grooming him up for these incredible purposes. And all of a sudden, he gets sick. And it's on his deathbed that he makes his commitment to the Lord that if God would heal him, he would serve him forever. And God healed him. And that's how the gospel was brought into Southern Arizona. Father Kino was, um, he, he was amazing. Uh, just to think that he was, um, he felt called and led to, to, to evangelize in this area. My name is Matt Schrader. We're here at Painted Swirl Studios and I'm getting a tattoo of Father Kino. And to be honest, I never thought I would be uh, face down getting a tattoo of Father Kino. So I was tagged in a Facebook post um, regarding a project that had to do with Christian artists. And for me the obvious choice was Father Kino. And I put a Facebook post if anyone had a connection to Father Kino. And Pastor Matt responded, my connection to Father Kino is that despite opposition, he still utilized his own resources to be a missionary. And he provided, he provided for them, and he showed them how to, um, a sustainable way of living with Christ. You hungry? And what a privilege it is that um, we get to live out that calling in the present day, that we get to carry on the spiritual heritage of the foundation that Father Kino laid in this area. What, what's going on? Uh, I just got liver cancer. Liver cancer, uh-huh. Well, I would like to, um, I'd like to pray for that. He's very special to me being a Tucson native here and I had known his story, but the more I started to study Father Kino and um, realized that his heart and soul really was to preach the gospel of peace and reconciliation. Father Kino was known for his coming through here in the 1600s. He was a missionary. 
And so um, we're kind of representing the modern day, what, you know, living out the prayers that he prayed for this area and doing the street evangelism. Oh, Holy Ghost, give him that healing touch right now. Yes, Complete sir. wholeness, Lord. We're carrying out that mission and, and that purpose. And I can only imagine that the prayers that we're soaking into this area, that will be carried on 100 years, 200 years, 300 years from now. We'll see the fruit of that. It's an amazing calling. It's, a, it's an amazing thing to uh, be allowed to be an answer to, to prayers like people like Father Kino and, and to live out the spiritual heritage that was planted here so many, many years ago. Um, for me, I feel like one of the most impactful things about the story of Father Kino was just that he, he just used what he had. He was into like mapping and exploring and he was a rancher so he knew how to grow crops and make food from wheat and that's what he like taught the, the native people that he came in contact with. And I think a lot of times as Christians we feel like um, for us to be significant we have to be like preaching to the masses or leading some huge ministry or something like that. But God just calls us to steward what we have and what he's put in front of us. Domingo de Grazia is an incredible performer, um, classical guitarist, and he's been doing background music for us tonight and is, um, has graciously offered to, to be our entertainment tonight. Uh, and he's going to perform an original piece that he created for this exhibit. Father Kino, um had a lot of struggles and he had a lot to a lot of work to do and he certainly helped a lot of people so in putting together the song I kept with a, the kind of southwest motif the sound that I that I pulled together in this one uses um, two note voicings evoking um, sorrow evoking happiness evoking a really driving feel father Kino spent a lot of years uh, traveling across the desert working with people really helping them um, and that kind of uh, committed lifestyle that he had is something that I wanted the, the sound to drive. Southwest deserts of Arizona, and learning about Father Kino, he really identified with the um, the work that Kino had did to um, to help the Native Americans, bringing them um, cattle and seeds, bringing in a little bit more of an agriculture lifestyle. So we're driving out to the Altar Valley, where uh, Father Kino had established um, a lot of missions and served really the population of the Native Americans as far as bringing uh, Christianity to them. He would come out specifically and would have to visit different tribes. And we're going to go visit one of the spots that was used by um, many of the, the religious leaders that would come out and preach to the Native Americans called a visita. amazing that Father Kino would have ridden through all of this area. So the, the distances here in the Altar Valley are what's really impressive. They say that uh, Father Kino had something like 50,000 square miles that he was to uh, be in care of. That kind of connection really is what began to stabilize this whole area. This whole part of the Southwest began uh, seeing the influence of Father Kino in terms of having stabilized food sources. Um, the cattle trade. What's most inspiring to me about Father Kino was his ability to um, to work within what was to him a foreign land, but how he managed to traverse such huge distances in dedication to the people. That becomes the idea that drives um, giving to others, knowing that hundreds of years before it would have been Father Kino that was up here. Um, 
really is inspirational. It really does give a perspective on, on life and the time that we have and how to use it. I think that uh, De Grazia's connection with Father Kino um, came from the fact that Father Kino was very, very kind uh, to the Indians. The significance that Father Kino brought to the area was his delight of the people. He baptized thousands of people. He established 21 missions within the Sonoran area. Well, Father Kino passed away, and it was about 50 years later that the Jesuit priests left the region, the Franciscan priests came in, and that set the stage for Father Garces. He loved every person he met. Uh, they loved him. He had a charisma that um, really brought the people into the church. So Juan Bautista de Anza, who's a commander over at the military Presidio at Tubac, saw a strategic opportunity to build a Presidio in the Tucson area, which is right at the base of a mountain. But he knew in order to have that happen, he had to have the agreement of the native people here. And he knew that the best person to be able to negotiate that was Father Garces because of Father Garces' relationship with the Native Americans in the area. So Father Garces approached the Native Americans with the idea of the Presidio, and they were in agreement with it on the one condition, and that one condition was that a church was built. And that is the genesis of our city, Tucson, it became Presidio San Agustin de Tucson. I chose the Sisters of Carondelet because, um, one, they're women. I wanted to know what the hardships they had to endure were. And I just felt that they embodied this pioneering spirit that I think Christ wants us to have at all times. They climbed over mountains. They climbed over um, territories. They faced danger at every step. They trusted God even when they, when they didn't know. Um, what was going to happen the next day. I chose to put a dress on um, to relate somewhat to what they were experiencing with the, the restrictions that a dress has when you're trying to move through the desert. They didn't know what they were getting into. You know, it's kind of funny when you read history, you think uh, there's an assumption that they knew what they were that they were getting into. And I wanted to come also out into the desert without knowing what I was getting into in terms of what I, how I was going to move around water, tugging, pulling. I think these sisters. They did not know what they were going to get into, but they accepted. They, they did not back down from the request that was a really difficult request. of Carondelet, their statement is that they're Christ's reconciling presence in the world, serving the dear neighbor. And I think that's a beautiful statement. That's basically all we are here, you know, to reconciliation. There's only one ministry. There's not a lot of ministries. It's reconciliation with Christ, and we're to serve our neighbors. What was the heart of these women? More than what are the facts that are presented in books. 
I want a heart like theirs. When I first read about the Sisters of Carondelet, um, I was really, you know, in a moment of respect for, for what they did for, you know, people that they never even knew. You know, they, they traveled such a treacherous journey to, to get down here, uh, faced many things along the way. You know, I'm sure each one of them probably, you know, had their moments where they may have, you know, questioned their their path or you know ask God what am I doing here and so this is my version of them after they've been picked up by their army escort and they're um, making their triumphant triumphal entry towards Tucson <laughs> and then I I chose the angel as their guardian along the way the sisters of Carondelet were brought in by Bishop Salpoint to establish education and medicine, bring medicine with them. And as a result of their coming in, the women or the young girls of Tucson were educated for the first time. I named the painting From Ashes. Um, and in a sense, you know, Tucson came up from the ashes. It had this rebirth uh, once they did what they did, uh, starting schools and, you know, hospitals and just really fundamental in the growth of Tucson. I love how this this particular one is coming right out of the fire and going up into the corn plant and then the different parts to their story. And I used a, a crooked, jagged uh, plant that's still green and fruitful to represent their, just the difficulty of, of growing. Then the other part was I added was these little saguaros in the background, kind of representing the people, the children that they served um, during that time that they were here. Then again, the bottom you see uh, the rocks and the people in those forms of those rocks uh, being in the, in the fire. And I think that it would be good to just define pretty clearly what's happening here. You've got an individual who has come to a point of saying, I really want to serve my Creator God. I don't want to mess around in life. I want to be very significant in my life. And there's a, there's a, there's a point where there's a sacrifice to what is being done here. After the arrival of the Southern Pacific Railroad, many of the railroad workers would uh, be injured. And so the sisters saw this, took the need to Bishop Salpoint, and he was able to create um, St. Mary's Hospital. And two years later, he gave ownership of St. Mary's Hospital over to the sisters. Uh, this is a song that uh, myself and Micah wrote. It is uh, about Bishop Salpoint. Uh, so this song actually is about perseverance and uh, never giving up and continuing to fight when it seems hopeless. So I hope you enjoy. This song is called Apache. Yeah, that sounds sweet. Yeah, it'd be cool, like, because if we just, if we just kind of hung on that beat, like the boom, 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 because you just, you want to, like, kind of carry it a little bit, but not too much. Yeah. So if you stay on that and then try to move up, I don't know, to see what else. And then kind of switch it up right here. Yeah. There you go. Walk okay. Down. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's do the whole thing again. He came a long way down from what he knew. South Point, the man that God chose to use. He finds himself inside a carriage, traveling on a road that's far from home. So, like lyrically, what are you thinking? <clears throat> Where do you want this so to come? So it basically out? starts out with 
Um, he came a long way down from what he knew. Sal Point, the man that God chose to use, uh, he finds himself inside a carriage traveling on a road far from home, and it leaves him with an impression that he doesn't really know if he should go. So just like thinking of being in that carriage, knowing the danger that's ahead of you, but knowing that God has called you, and so you're like kind of fighting. This is like this inward battle of like, man, I really feel like I need to go and I need to do this, but at the same time, like your humanness and your, like your flesh is like, what? No, I don't want to go. <laughs> like, you know, like. One, two, three, four, cause I've been waiting for the hearts to wake. I've been waiting for the hearts to wake to turn to you. I've been waiting for the hearts to wake. I've been waiting for the hearts to wake, Lord. Let it be known there's a beat for you. It will take time. His love will find. It will take time to. And then after that it goes, the chorus is, cause I've been waiting for the hearts to wake. I've been waiting for the hearts to wake to turn to you. And basically that's like the life of a priest. Like yeah, he's you, feeling called to like. He's feeling called to people and it's the commitment to a people, you yeah. know? And like knowing that, dude, he doesn't know what's gonna happen when he shows up to Tucson, if he does. Like he doesn't know how those people are doing. Like there was just an urgency for someone to plant something there and so he was obedient and did it. And so like not really having an idea of like what to walk into. So in 1870, around the same time that the Sisters of Carondelet made their arrival into Tucson, the Protestant Reformation, which was expanding all throughout the world, had officially come to Tucson as well. The first Protestant influences in this area were actually street preachers who came from the east and uh, came here to save souls in this rugged frontier city that was just out in the Wild West. Protestant churches were um, first came into this area probably in the late 1800s. Because there were no buildings, they met in the courthouse or the city halls. And by 1890, those congregations had a uh, full membership of about 250 people. These congregations were gathering places for believers to come together and encourage each other to share the gospel in the community and be salt and light. So we have visual art that's been contributed. And tonight we're gonna have an example of spoken word art from Myra Duran. Okay, so I um, chose to write about Josephine B. Hughes. So I chose to write about Josephine B. Hughes. She's also known as the mother of Arizona. Um, she has a laundry list of firsts, and so what captured my attention was she fought for women's rights, beginning with um, establishing the first public school for girls, becoming a teacher herself. Um, she also ran the Arizona Daily Star and eight years before Congress established a nationwide movement for women to vote, Josephine and her son had given women eight years before the 19th Amendment the right to vote here in our state. Um, what, what captured my heart was that first and foremost she was a mom. Um, and that's why I chose to write about her. Her entrance alone into the old Pueblo, uh, when I was reading an article, said that she journeyed here with a shotgun in one hand and an infant in another. And that's when I was like, this is, this is the one. I have to know more about her. Dear Josephine, your story is quite surprising, humbling, convicting. If a picture is worth a thousand words, then a thousand words I owe you. 
I would begin by painting a picture of a woman whose passion and burdens outweighed her fears. A woman that approached the frontier with an infant in one hand and a shotgun in another. Dear Josephine, as a mother myself, I have to ask, what prejudice atmosphere were you tired of inhaling? that it was worth sacrificing your next breath? Or was this dry and desolate land not foreign to you because it mimicked the conditions within your sternum? Dear Josephine, I am convinced that no mother would put her child in such a position unless she was willing to change the ground that they would soon stand on. And today, I stand on that ground. Dear Josephine, I am walking in your dreams. Forgive me for taking your strife for granted. You are evidence as to why God allows our lives to taste hardship. Because hardship is the very antidote necessary to move mountains. Josephine, I am astounded by your story your aim and precision. I would like to think that if you were here, you would not pass me the baton, rather a shotgun, and teach me how to lock and load my convictions, make use of my depression, cock back this righteous anger. And that's my prayer for this city, is that more rise with the same determination, that more rise with the same passion wrapped with the fierce humility to abolish the injustices of our generation. And that is my prayer for this city, is that we all rise with the same determination, with the same passion, with the same dreams. That is my prayer for this city. Yeah. The uh, gallery reception was really amazing. The turnout was incredible. Uh, the people were wonderful, and it was really fun getting to meet all the other artists. So I was struck by Oliver Comstock's uh, compassion. I kind of refer to Oliver Comstock as a Mother Teresa of Tucson. I started doing some research online as to what flowers represent compassion and I found that the peony uh, oftentimes represents compassion. Uh, he really had a heart for uh, the poor. He had a heart for uh, people who were marginalized by their their disease. Part of my research, I was looking into um, how Oliver Comstock affected the community and the, um, you know, the hospitals that he built and, and things like that. But what I found is that the Comstock Children's Foundation was still in existence. And um, I, I thought that was amazing that uh, his influence reached all the way into today. And so I contacted the Comstock Children's Foundation. I went in and spoke to Judith, uh, who runs the foundation. That's so the is, original Comstock okay. Children's Hospital. And she was very, very pleasant, very, very happy to show me photographs of the Comstock Children's um, hospital and the preventorium and all sorts of things that uh, were the precursor to the Comstock Children's Foundation. After that, um, I was put in touch with Rebecca Lieberman, who was also inspired by Oliver Comstock, and that was really fun to get to um, meet Rebecca, get to know her, and share our um, emotional impact uh, that we had had by researching Oliver. A lot of times um, I would think about what he sacrificed and he was willing, he was willing to put his, his well-being aside because we know tuberculosis is highly contagious. 
Well, Oliver Comstock actually lost two of his children to tuberculosis, so obviously it was very near and dear to his heart. Uh, he would ride through Tent City on a bicycle, and he had mutton chop sideburns and circular glasses, and the sight of him bringing food and clothing and other aid to the people of Tent City was, was absolutely welcomed by them. Um, I'm going to have, as soon as I get to this area, will be the people walking into the city. And, and Comstock will be viewing the people walking in the city. And of course, they're walking all to go to one place and be united, and that's to go to fellowship. If today we would have more of us walking in the light of Oliver E. Comstock, mm -hmm. our little city would be built up with a strong foundation, a firm foundation. Uh, the group that he ministered to in Tent City were really treated almost like lepers. Uh, it was a scary time, I think, for, for Tucson. Tuberculosis was a really contagious disease, and uh, people who were healthy didn't want to be anywhere near people who had tuberculosis. This particular variety, uh, while it's a white peony, it has a very deep little segments of um, sort of a scarlet or crimson red. That was a bit of a metaphor for people who had tuberculosis and would actually cough up blood. Um, so I wanted to incorporate um, the red sort of down into these congested areas. He saw all these people really suffering uh, in Tent City, um, some of which even committed suicide because they uh, had no hope. And he provided a sense of hope for them. He ministered to them not only spiritually, but he ministered to them physically and emotionally. Um, he provided uh, clean water, he provided soup, uh, other food items, clean bedding, uh, all sorts of, of really practical items that, that they needed. And that just really uh, struck me. Uh, it was kind of funny, I think. It probably took a couple days after I read his um, uh, biography before I could really even talk about it to people without getting really emotional. Uh, it, 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 I, I would have loved to have met him. What I hope people will will get from this and, and find through my painting, that um, Oliver Comstock will um, inspire us to be more compassionate and to show uh, the love of Christ to the community in a much broader, uh, much more visible way and, and to go out of our way to do that. For tuberculosis victims, there was Oliver Comstock. And for Oliver Comstock, there was Harold Bell Wright. Harold Bell Wright wrote several books and became a very um, significant author of his time frame. His more memorable books was Shepherd in the Hills. He was drawn to Tucson because he was going to die. He contracted tuberculosis, and so this was the logical destination. But something amazing happened, and he didn't. And in that period, he published a written work for the American magazine that circulated all throughout the United States, and the title of it was Why I Didn't Die. And it espoused Tucson as being this destination, a health resort destination in our nation, and became wildly popular. We surrender all. We surrender all to follow you. To follow you into fear. The thing that's amazing to me about Harold Bell Wright is he leveraged his influence as a, as a writer for the kingdom. I mean, he used his, his, his books and turned them into screenplays and productions that were used downtown and downtown Tucson. And he brought A-list actors and actresses from Hollywood 
And they put these productions together and all the proceeds, every single penny of the proceeds went toward creating sustainable health care for everyone in our city. There's a building where we all meet Reading words that Jesus preached There is room for all In these four walls To go out on the street Bring the outcast And all in need to the banquet hall Of these four walls We hear you on the Several months ago, Wes and I were talking, and I decided that uh, it would be really great for us to go ahead and do something for him that we honor him. So all of us have been, in one way or another, graduates from the Gospel Rescue Mission, where he was uh, the director for a long time. His, his teachings were probably the most important part of my changing my life. The reason that we're having this is to honor Lonnie's community service. I mean, uh, I am so grateful that God put him in my life that I, I there's no words. So let's get the party started, it's fun now. Never been lost for words, amen. For me, she was my lifesaver, my angel. Now, it tears me up and I'm crying because for the very first time, I felt another man who truly loved people with no conditions. He was a father to me, the father I'd never had, because I didn't grow up with a father, but I ran into my father. I know how you affected my life, and I know that you know, we've had this discussion, how that's affected my life, but I don't know if you know my family first. Uh, my friends, and then every man that I talk to every day uh, gets the benefit of that wisdom. We will find our strength in you Together as we journey through So live in water, come and flow Across the desert we call home We belong Yeah, we belong my prayer is that uh, I won't forget this a few months after this uh, event is over and the pictures are put away, that we won't go back to business as usual. But I'll find a way to uh, keep in my heart and mind uh, the fact that, that Tucson is a community. It's not just a city. Perhaps we haven't felt as much a part of the community as we could. Perhaps by making prayer, a concerted effort and participating 
uh, maybe I'll gain a little bit of that community feeling back. I was also really challenged to be praying for the city more, to like remember like we're all one body here, here in Tucson and here in, in our church body. Ways that we can engage with God through worship, through art. I think that that is really close to my heart. Well, we belong. Yeah, we belong. If I had to come away with one concept or one lesson that I've learned, it's that one person can make a difference. And so if you, if you feel the Holy Spirit moving you to do something, you should do it. Because the actions I take or the actions you take uh, can affect people for generations to come. You know, after doing this, I just, I just feel like we're, our heart just has to be so connected to God and to the Holy Spirit or we won't step out. We won't take risks with our lives. I'd like to stand before God someday and, and be able to say I did something, anything, that would help my dear neighbor. We